Hello and welcome to episode six of Just Branding. Um, today we've got a treat for you. Today we have the fantastic Rob Mayerson with us. Um, if you don't know Rob, he's the founder of Heirloom, a coalition of independent but aligned seasoned brand and marketing pros based in California. And Rob has an amazing background. He's traveled the world, um, uh, basically helping many brands um, from small right through to very, very large with their brand strategy. Brands like HP, he's worked for as strategists, as well as agency side in, uh, in some big global brand agencies like Interbrand. So it's a pleasure, Rob, to have you on the show. Um, one other thing I should mention about Rob is he has a great podcast, which me and Jacob are big fans of, However, it's not as good as ours. But no. if you were to uh, <laughs> if you were to, uh, to to look it up, you'd find that there's some absolute legends that Rob has had on his podcast. So definitely check it out after ours, of course. And it's called <laughs> How Brands Are Built. Rob, welcome to Just Branding. Thanks so much, Matt. Matt Jacob, thanks for inviting me to to be on the show. Well, um, one of the things um, that I find fascinating about you, Rob, is that um, looking through your profiles and stuff and, and having various conversations with you, you specialize in, um, in, in naming and positioning brands. And what is fantastic about that is that, that this podcast, this episode, we really like to kind of pick your brains on that subject of positioning uh, brands in, in the marketplace. Right. And so... We want to grill you about that. Is that is that? Are you open to that? Sounds good. Yeah, fire away. Super. Okay. So, first question for you, sir. Um, well, we always like to start with this because branding does have this weird kind of identity problem. Like, no one really knows what what it means, and everybody has a slight different take on that. So, first question to you is: is Can you help us out? How do you kind of define brand and specifically brand positioning? Yeah, it's frustrating how many definitions of brand you can find, isn't it? Um, the way I think of it is, uh, I guess I have a pretty broad definition that tries to capture a lot of the different, I think, intended meanings of brand. So I like to say it's the ideas that sit behind the identity of and the experience created by a organization, whether that's a, a company or it could be a product, whatever it is that you're creating the brand for. But I like to I like to break it up that way: ideas, identity, and experience. Um, I feel like you know, as much as I'd like to make it more succinct than that, that really captures the full gamut of everything that I think of when I think of brand. Fantastic. And in terms of brand positioning, how would how does that sort of fit into yeah. ideas, identity, and experiences? Yeah, it's a good, it's actually um, interesting the way you've asked it, sort of comparing it to that definition of brand. It, it really, um, I think a lot of it connects to the idea part of the definition of brand. And it's, it's, it's a little bit easier to define positioning. Um, there's a little bit less diversity in, in definition. It's really about owning a conceptual territory in the marketplace or in the mind of your customers vis-a-vis um, -vis competition. So that's a really important part of it. It, it. You can't position a brand in a vacuum. You have to understand what else is out there, whether that's direct competitors or if you are the first to market in a new industry, you still need to think about positioning against whatever people have done before. Um, so that's how I think of positioning and, and it really, you could think of it as um, impacting definitely identity even down to visual identity and, and certainly the experience created by a brand as well. But it's really at that idea stage where you're still talking about strategy. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, the, in terms of kind of finding that conceptual place in the market, that, that position, um, yeah. what I'd love, uh, and I'm sure the listeners uh, and Jacob, who's also here, by the way, uh, listeners, um, he's just sitting quietly. He he said he'd take a back seat. So, uh, that's a, that's a problem. We're going to get him in. Don't worry. You'll hear from him shortly. Um, but, but what we'd love to hear about is, you know, in terms of um, all of your experience and the, in the wealth of your career, um, what would you sort of typically take a client through in terms of process to lead to getting to that place where, the, where you're comfortable as the strategist, that they're, they're in a good place? brand position and they also are comfortable in in that with that sort of direction 
Sure. Well, every project that I've ever worked on has to start with discovery or immersion, fact finding. Um, and so that's usually your, your phase one of a multi-phase project. Um, and the easiest way, uh, it may be an oversimplification, but the easiest way to break down the way that we would, would approach discovery usually, I, I think of the three C's. Um, so that's company or client, uh, competition, and customer or consumer. Um, so we do research on the company itself, whether if it is building a brand for a company. Um, that might be internal interviews. It might be reading through materials that they've created. If it's a small business, you might just read their business plan um, or you might talk to the founder about what her or his vision is or was for the, for the business. Uh, if it's a bigger company that's been around for a while, then you might have a whole bunch of brand guidelines from 20 years ago that you can reference and really start to get a feel for where the brand has been and, and where it is now. Then uh, looking at customers or consumers, um, you want to understand what's relevant to them. Um, who, who is it that is a buyer or a potential buyer? Um, so that could be quantitative research. If you're doing sort of a large scale project, you might have surveys, you might have third party data that you could rely on for smaller projects um, or for more sort of niche brands. You might just get a handful of customers in a room and do a little focus group or something like that. And then for competition, um, you need to, again, get an understanding of, of how the competitors are positioning themselves. Um, either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, it could be that you look at a competition and realize that they've really intentionally positioned themselves in certain parts of the market by the language that they use, the design. Um, when, you, when you look at the competition, um, you, you'll notice that they maybe have positioned themselves based on the, the language that they use. So we might call that verbal identity or based on their visual identity, or even just based on the ideas that they seem to have built their brands around. A lot of times you'll look at industries and see that everybody's basically saying the same thing. Um, the, the kind of overused phrase for that is a, a sea of sameness. Everybody's looks the same, sounds the same, especially in a B2B um, space. A lot of times you'll see things like that, um, but you need to get an understanding of, of what they're saying um, and how they're perceived. And then based on those three C's, um, so I often draw that as a Venn diagram with an overlap between those three circles, um, you wanna find something that is true um, to the brand. So you, you do that by doing that internal discovery that's relevant to customers. So you, you hopefully achieve that by doing some research with customers and that is differentiating, which is typically referred to as one of the most important aspects of building a strong brand is that it's unique or, or distinctive. And so that's impossible unless you have a really solid understanding of how the competition is positioned. So it's Jacob here. Uh, pleasure to have you on here, Rob. So Thanks. on differentiation, I think that is a huge part of this. And I would be curious to know if you work on differentiation after the fact that you've worked on all these, um, the three C's that you mentioned. Do you kind of work backwards or how do you go about differentiation? Um, I really, I mean, the, the, the ideal situation, which of course doesn't always happen, is that all of these, uh, these three C's and therefore the idea of credibility and relevance and differentiation can all be achieved simultaneously. Um, that you're searching for one idea or a couple of different options for positioning territories, so to speak, that, that achieve all three of those things at once. Um, in reality, uh, it's very hard to do. Um, and sometimes you find that uh, the positioning or the, the differentiation comes a little bit further down the road, maybe, that it's more about the brand personality that really makes it distinctive than about, um, strictly speaking, a positioning idea. Um, so there are ways to uh, to work with what you've got and, and try to build a strong brand, even if the underlying idea maybe is not as differentiating as you would like it to be. Um, so there's sort of that perfect world answer and then the real world answer. Sometimes you find yourself kind of differentiating a little bit on the back end. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So to, I just want to go dive a little bit deeper into that. So there's a lot yeah. of commodities out there or service-based businesses that 
do have a hard time of differentiating itself. So by looking at these three C's, like how, how do you actually go through that process of finding it? Like, I know you mentioned a few things earlier, but let's, let's go back down to like, I don't know, a dentist, for example, or something that is commodity based. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Yeah. So in really well-defined spaces, so dentistry is one of those, but just as well, uh, we could be talking about uh, laundry detergent or something like that, where it's pretty clearly delineated. Um, there are a couple of different things you can do and, and sort of classic positioning, the way it uh, was originally written about back in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, one of the concepts in there, um, I don't think they use this phrase, but the phrase you hear a lot now is creating a category. Um, and so even if, uh, even if you're all dentists, you might be uh, the only blank dentist. You might create a new category by being um, the, the dentist that specializes in working with kids. In fact, that's where I take my kids. I don't know if, if everywhere has this all over the world now, but I certainly didn't get that when I was a kid. Um, I mean, there is pediatric dentistry, but the place that I take my kids is clearly um, really built for kids. Uh, they have the, the TV screens on the ceiling. So when the kids lean back in the chair, they can watch a movie and it's so good. It's so well done that my kids like going to the dentist, which I feel <laughs> like kind of defeats the purpose because that was always the threat for me that, uh, you know, brush your teeth or you'll have to go to the dentist. If I say that to my kids, they're, <laughs> they're so likely to... Of your kids like eating sweets deliberately exactly. to, uh, to get to the dentist. Exactly. They've done it too well. Uh, but, but that's all to say, you know, that's a way of positioning, even in that field of dentistry, which seems like a dentist is a dentist. Uh, you could be the dentist for kids. You could specialize in teenagers, knowing that uh, a lot of people need braces around that time. And so you could be, you know, it could be age-based. Um, it could be ge geographically based, you know, you could be uh, the only dentist in a certain region. Um, it could be, you know, they're, they're really, that's kind of the exercise is thinking of what are all the different ways to slice and dice this um, in ways that are relevant to the customer base. So obviously you could say you're the only dentist with a red logo. Uh, or something which would be a terrible color for a dentist, by the way. Um, but but nobody's going to care about that. That's not relevant. It might be differentiating, but it's not relevant. So it really is about finding that intersection between ways of looking at the market, different ways of sort of rotating the market to see um, how the different brands or the different options line up on different axes. Um, and then where there's a gap that you could fill and that that is kind of one of the one of the phrasings in the original positioning book was about filling a hole so finding that hole that you can fill um as long as it's it's something that's relevant to to your potential customers well said thank you i i think differentiation strategies are like like you're touching on there's so many different ways to go about it and like you said it could be price it could be niching it could be your heritage it could be how you simplify yeah. someone's life it could be like a different purchase experience there's all different ways to do it um like you could use them you could take on a competitor or you could serve an unmet um, need you could lighten the yep. mood in different ways so there's a lot of different ways that companies can differentiate so thanks for exploring that I'm not sure it's a great that. point jacob i mean there's and it, it is interesting to think about and, and do some some research on how other brands and even totally different industries have organized themselves and look at how um, a brand in a, in a tangential industry maybe has managed to stand apart by focusing on a certain idea. It, one way of thinking about that range that you just described is it can go from really tangible or rational things. Um, you know, you can be the cheap option um, or you can be the expensive option. Um, you could simply sell a different size of the product that nobody else sells. You know, there are these really sort of easy, tangible things. And I think when you look at really um, new industries where there just aren't a lot of players and there hasn't been that much um, maturity in the industry yet, that's how you'll see brands often kind of segment themselves. It's, it's based on these really simple, understandable things about price or speeds and feeds. You know, ours works better than theirs, faster than theirs. But then as industries mature, um, 
it, it starts to get harder and harder to position in that way. And that's when you go from the tangible and rational over to the intangible and more emotional side or abstract side of the spectrum. And you start to see brands um, like in the world of gasoline, you know, you'll see brands try to position themselves as being more environmentally friendly, um, which is ironic in the, in the oil and gas industry. But you, that's where you have BP who, um, you know, certainly um, missed the mark a little bit uh, in the way that they did this, but, um, you know, came out with a, a green and yellow logo and started talking a lot about um, environmental friendliness. It was, I would say that that's one that is differentiating and relevant, but ultimately lacked that third C of, of credibility and, and authenticity. They couldn't back it up, um, or at least couldn't back it up credibly in the eyes of customers. Um, but, but you see that sort of move to that shift to um, the more abstract side of that spectrum over time, generally. I love your Venn diagram um, idea and marrying those three C's with the, with the three outputs that you, know, that, that, we that you have to test against. I think that's really smart. Um, one of the things you've talked about is relevance, right, uh -huh. to the customer base. So let's say you explore the market and uh, you find a white space that you think, hey, nobody is playing in this area. Like, you know, nobody around here is the dentist for kids, right? Right. Um, but um, how do you go about establishing whether or not that is indeed a relevant thing for yeah. uh, the, the market you're in? Like, how do, you, how do you sort of outline that market? How do you establish that side of things? You've got any thoughts uh, to help our our audience on in regards to that? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, the simple or, or kind of quick answer is, is again, research or, or that discovery phase. Um, it, it just, you made me think of a quote from uh, uh, Stephen King, not the, not the horror writer, but uh, a famous ad planner who said something along the lines of, um, you know, if the only job of the strategist was to find the white space in the market, then you'd look at the coffee space and see that people love hot coffee and people love iced coffee and you'd sell lukewarm room temperature coffee and think that you'd <laughs> hit it out of the ballpark. But of Genius. course, nobody wants that. Um, and so you need to figure out whether it's something that somebody, somebody wants. And so the, the kind of classic answer again is do your research, um, talk to people, explore whether there are unmet needs, um, you know, ask the right questions in those one-on-one -on -one interviews or in the surveys. Um, research is tough. It's tough to do right, especially when you sort of don't know what you're looking for. Um, and you'll often hear, whether it's a myth or not, you'll hear about Steve Jobs supposedly not really believing in that kind of research that he would just, he would tell the consumer what they wanted. You know, he would, he would figure it out based on his own um, genius intuition. I don't know how true that is, but you still hear um, people saying that in some cases, research can't tell you um, what the next really in an innovative step change in an industry might be um, because people aren't ready to really think that way. So there's a little bit of maybe that, um, that way of thinking too, that you just need to have some faith as an entrepreneur um, in, the, in the power of your ideas. But generally, I think you can, you know, you'd be wise to think of it as maybe validation research if you do have an idea um, that you can share without being worried that somebody's going to going to take the idea or, or find a way to share it that's sort of subtle, um, but just gives you a hint of like, are people going to want this? Are they going to be willing to pay for it? Are they going to be willing to pay enough for it that I can make money, um, you know, with a business like this? I think it would be a good idea to, to try to tease that out. Fantastic. Great. So um, one of the other things is that, uh, uh, oh, sorry, Jacob, did you want to, uh, do you want to yeah, segue? So yeah, I was going to loop back to the, the BP thing you're talking about because BP is a like one of my favorite logos. I love logo design. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> because Land this is in 2000. Yeah, yeah. It's um, such a brilliant example of how powerful logo design can be to portray a certain image. So, like an oil company using like a, a bright energy flower with green and everything to convey <laughs> this this feel completely not authentic, but um, <laughs> it's very it's a very strong image. Um, so, I just want to touch on that. I also want to jump back to um, the consumer because we've talked about out of your three C's in the Venn diagram, we've talked a lot about the, the company and the client, 
But what we haven't talked about is the consumer uh, who we're actually targeting. And this is a huge part of positioning, right? It's probably probably yeah. the, mo the most important part. I don't know if you agree with that, but um, it's, it's about who you're targeting and how you're going to target, how you're going to message them. So I don't know if you want to dive into how you go about researching or like just that bucket of the sea. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it depends on the, the size of, a lot of it depends on the size of the client and the nature of the market. So, you know, anything from massive B2C organizations like a Procter & Gamble uh, down to tiny B2B companies, you know, a mom and pop company that is a supplier of widgets for some manufacturing industry. Um, th that range will really, a lot of, will, will largely determine the best actual tactical way to, to do that research um, but generally speaking it, in my experience at least it's gonna be some combination of interviews um, going and talking to actual customers a lot of times we like to talk to past customers if possible past customers who've maybe switched to a competitor to understand why they switched that can be hard to get them on the phone sometimes but that's lovely to have that perspective. Um, current customers, prospective customers, maybe that one customer that you've been trying to get a, a sale out of for a year unsuccessfully, you know, let's talk to them as well. Um, so getting that kind of cross section can be useful. And, and if it's a small enough business, um, if it's sort of a high touch sale, B2B industry, then maybe you talk to a dozen customers and you feel like you get a pretty well-rounded feel for, um, how their customers are thinking. If it's much larger or consumer-based, um, you're probably gonna wanna look at either third-party research that's out in the world, whether you have to purchase that or not from a Nielsen or, or some other kind of research uh, company, or doing fielding your own primary research and doing a large-scale survey, which is expensive. So, um, you know, a lot of clients uh, don't have the ability to do that necessarily, although there are some inexpensive tools that you can use now. Um, but it also, you know, it gets a little complicated with permissions and regulatory and, and legal uh, constraints around just, you know, not spamming people with surveys and, and using their data and things like that. Um, but usually some combination of, of those two and sometimes focus groups, which, which get a pretty bad rap. Um, but there are definitely uh, projects on which I felt that focus groups have been, have been useful. Um, so usually it's some combination of those. I, I'm sure there are other things. I mean, there, there are things that you can do around eye tracking on websites, um, social media listening, you know, some of these more, um, I don't want to call them new age because it, it's, it's not that new anymore, but um, these more kind of digital oriented ways of gathering information. I think those are usually um, either supplementary to those more kind of core things of just talking to customers or it would really be um, dependent on specifically what you're creating if, if you're if you or your client is creating an app um, then maybe you do need to do a little more um, kind of ux research where you're looking at how people are swiping through your app or, or other apps to figure out how their behavior um, is working rather than doing interviews or in addition to doing interviews one of the um, the things, Rob, that I know that you are a specialist in, and I know, um, for example, when you worked for HP, I think you were their, their naming strategist. Um, and I know you've worked globally in naming. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder if we could just sort of move that into this conversation and, and, and ask you about how you would sort of go about, you know, either renaming or creating a new name in mm -hmm. a brand positioning projects like we're talking yeah. about here how, how would you sort of attack that yeah great question um and yeah naming is uh I, i've spent a lot of my career doing sort of core brand strategy work of which brand positioning is is really a, a hallmark i think and um for a long time naming was sort of subsidiary to that and then around 2012 um, at Interbrand, I, I really shifted full-time into more of a naming and verbal identity role and I carried that through to HP and now still do quite a bit of naming work. Um, so 
I, it's it's actually, I think we can make a pretty good segue here from, from the positioning conversation and naming, and, and you did it nicely, Matt. Um, but, you know, you asked how we start that positioning process, and that's really that discovery and, um, and immersion. Next step would be the sort of analysis and development of the strategy itself, a lot of which is, is words. You know, a, a strategists work in words quite a bit um, and language, trying to find the right way to, to capture ideas. Um, language is one of the best tools we have to capture ideas, although design, visual design can also uh, can do that, can do that well. Um, but trying to capture that idea um, in something like a positioning statement, um, you know, a relatively short statement that, that expresses what the brand is, who it's for, and why it matters, um, just uh, simply put. That statement, if you're working on, say, building a new brand from scratch, should be one of, if not the core piece of a naming brief um, that would then go to a naming team or a namer or the same team, depending on, on you know, who's doing the work. Uh, to help the, to serve as a springboard into a, a name generation uh, phase of work. Um, so, you, and sometimes you will literally take that positioning statement and find word, circle words within it. I mean, this is one of the, the kind of, um, I think the, the best and most transparent ways I've seen this done uh, of transitioning from the strategy over to either naming or something like logo design is to take that strategy work sit down with a, a red pen, start circling words and thinking, how would that word come to life as a name or as a design element? And, and it, you know, it's partly for the client so that they can see that the strategy is built in, but, but it really should be partly for, for you as a strategist or a designer or a namer to make sure that you're staying true to whatever that, that strategy was once it's, uh, once it's baked. So that's how I would think of the, that transition from positioning to creating a new name um, for renaming, it, it could be a little bit different. I think then it really depends on, you know, the first question has to be, why are you renaming? Um, and there are, you know, so many things in business and, and branding, I feel like there's kind of no wrong answers, but I think when you ask, why are you renaming? Similarly to maybe why are you redesigning your logo or rebranding? There are some wrong answers, <laughs> potentially. Um, it shouldn't be because you feel like it or uh, you're tired of your own logo or name. Um, you know, that is a place where it has to be driven by um, customers, customer first and how they're thinking. Um, but there are different ways to rename and, and that might govern how you would approach it. Great. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny you should say that, like I was working today, funny enough, with a looking at a client um not too far away from you you're in california aren't you and, and actually just to, to sort of break the, the the podcast up a little bit you know rob i should just say is is tuning in at 2 p.m um jacob is in sydney uh and he's tuning in at 7 a.m and i'm here in the uk and i'm i'm tuning in at 10 p.m so if i come up with some strange stuff you know it'll happen. but um, yeah, yeah. I, I gotta thank you guys for giving me the only sane time here to, to no no that. well we've got to do it because you're if you're quite it was, kind to your guests <laughs> we do what we can we do what we can but no no but um yeah so not too far away from you uh i i believe in in the san francisco bay and it was funny because um the uh we were sort of starting the project and yeah. the name was already an acronym right which uh -huh. which um i immediately picked up on um as a question mark because it was meaningless um yeah. to i mean the full the full name when it was spread out it was four words but they oh, wow. immediately started talking about themselves in this acronym and um, I see. yeah so it just seemed to me quite quite um you know as a strategist quite early on that i you know you pick up on these things and you're like is that something that we want to keep and obviously i haven't said anything it's the early stage of the project yeah but um it's in the back of my head like um if uh, it, it seems that that they want to reposition and it so it seems like it's a good time to to open up that question around is the name right to you know to land um a position in this market like to really push yeah. that forward what do you think about acronyms as as, sure. as kind of brand names yeah, no, a lot of good questions in there. And I, I'll first say, and I know you don't need this advice, Matt, but for listeners um, who may find themselves in a similar position, um, my advice would be 
to tread lightly. <laughs> um, and your instinct clearly was right there. You don't win much point, many points as a, as a consultant coming in and, and trashing uh, some of the work that they've done in the past or the name or, or anything like that. Um, it may well be that they will wholeheartedly agree with you that it's time for the name to change. But until you know that, you want to uh, kind of dance around the edges of that rather than saying, hey, let's change the name because you could really lose credibility um, quickly that way. And for all you know, the CEO came up with it uh, themselves or their spouse came up with it. And <laughs> you don't want to, uh, you know, dig yourself a hole before the project is even started absolutely um, and i don't know if they're really well known in the industry and famous yeah. for this acronym name but from an as yeah. an outsider as often we are coming into these spaces it just seemed really awful <laughs> like yeah just, and that's the that's one of the big benefits that you provide as a consultant is being the outsider um you know there are obvious disadvantages because you don't know the industry as well but you also are coming at it with with a fresh set of eyes um Acronyms, uh, generally speaking, are sort of frowned upon by the community of professional namers. Um, there are, are, are times that I think it's um, reasonable. Um, there are certainly categories in which it's become um, an industry norm, which doesn't at all mean that it's right and, and could certainly mean that there's a big opportunity to steer clear of that. Um, but there are some famous brand name, or, or I guess sort of a brand, but NASA, for example, is actually an acronym. Um, and I mean, at least in the US, it's so embedded in, in everybody's mind. Most people don't know or think about what it stands for, but it, it just works uh, for some reason. Um, I should say that technically speaking, and this is one of these nerdy naming things, an acronym is an abbreviated name that you say out loud as a word, like NASA, whereas yeah. IBM, because you say those letters out loud, is, is technically an initialism. It's not technically an acronym. Um, I'll take that virtual slap. <laughs> no, no. Well, well, I don't know what the name is of the... Uh... Just keep getting ready, Rob, for what's coming. No, <laughs> um, no, no, that's true. No, thank you for the clarity. Yep, yep. Um, just an so, example here in the UK, we have a, um, a, like a, a, a supermarket store yeah. um, called Marks and Spencer right yes uh, and interesting that's correct it, uh, marks and sparks is is what it was nicknamed as but also consumers um referred to it as m and s just mm -hmm. off just instead of saying marks and spencer so what they actually did when they uh, they rebranded i think about five or six years ago and they actually adopted the consumer's language and they called uh -huh. themselves um m and s right and they yeah. the, the the brand identity and so in those instances, I kind of think it makes sense because yeah. they're adopting how people already think of them. And, and in fact, the consumer, in effect, makes, makes the decision of, as to what they're going to call your brand. You know, you yeah. can kind of signal, of, well, we want to be called this, but the consumer will ultimately decide. So adopting their language was a smart move. So in those instances, I think that's, that's really clever. But to off the bat go for an acronym, you know, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? I, generally, I think uh, it's not, not the acronym. strongest. Not acronym. Oh, just... initialism. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> um, yeah, generally, I think it's not the strongest path forward. Um, I would, yeah, generally speaking, try to avoid it. That said, there are cases where maybe there's an argument to be made for it. And so I, I think uh, it's best to keep an open mind. But um, unless there's that really strong argument for it, I think... Uh, there are all kinds of challenges with, with uh, initialisms. They're um, harder to remember generally, especially if you are in an ind industry where everybody is three letters or you know, if it's a law firm and it's all three names and everyone's abbreviating to the three letters of those three names. Um, when you're in that industry and you're so close to it, it may feel like, well, everybody knows the difference between LLS and LPS or something like that, but coming in from the outside and us as consultants, um, but also you know their customers maybe when they're when they're new to the industry, it's so confusing. It's it's just uh, alphabet soup, and so yeah, generally speaking, I'd steer clear. Brilliant. Um, anything else to say on naming? In oh yep, Jacob, yeah. you've got another question. Yeah, I have I have another question. So. Um, you said to tread, tread lightly, but often uh, as designers, we'll get clients come to us with a name already chosen. Whether it, mm -hmm. Where it came from, we don't know. And it may not be as strong as we wish it for it to be. So what is a, 
what is a, a process to do it nicely <laughs> to bring them yeah. <laughs> to actually get them to change the name? Um, yeah, well, I think it's a great question. Um, it, you know, in Matt's situation, I, I said something about you haven't you haven't gotten the credibility yet or, or sort of earned the goodwill yet to, to make that call. And so I do think part of it just just as a consultant is about waiting for the right time. Um, if this is a client of yours that you've been working with for a decade um, and they just have some new product that you're working on and you think the name is a, is a stinker, then maybe you've you've earned the right already to, to say how you feel about it. Um, but if you're new, it's a new relationship, then um, I do think treading lightly. I, that said, I, I certainly wouldn't advocate that consultants don't speak their mind. I mean, the, the reason we're getting paid is to give that, that expert advice and, and to tell our clients what we think they should do. And so um, I'm not saying to, to keep mum um, because I don't think you ever wanna prioritize uh, ideally, your your own sort of uh, your own the, the health of your relationship with your client. Um, you don't want to sacrifice the this sort of truth telling role that you have to play as a consultant. In the in the short term, that may benefit you benefit you because um, you haven't pissed off your client. But in the long term, uh, it it won't benefit anyone because you're not you're not giving them that expert advice that they're paying you for. So. I'm giving a long answer here, but I think, uh, you know, earning some credibility. So do some good work first, maybe, or uh, make sure you feel that you're in a good place where the, the client is ready to listen to your, your point of view. Um, phrase it in the right way. Uh, you know, if you're, it may just be about couching it. Um, so if you're a design, really a visual design expert and they respect you for that expertise, um, maybe you don't come out and say, I think this name is junk because uh, maybe they don't think of you as someone who, who even has the, the right to question a name, you know, you're not a namer. Um, but you could say something like from a design standpoint, um, I'm having trouble, you know, working with this name. It, it's, uh, it doesn't lend itself to, um, to visual applications. And, you know, have you thought about other, other ideas for the name or, or something like that? Um, so just sort of finding the right way to phrase it, um, finding the right time to do it. Uh, I think, you know, just being respectful and um, even what I just said of saying, look, this is, um, this is something that you may not want to hear. You know, <laughs> you may have invested a lot in this name. Um, you know, it may be that you yourself came up with this name, but you're paying me for my expert advice and, you know, I, I look at a lot of brand names every day and, and work with a lot of brands every day. And um, I feel like maybe this name could be improved upon. Um, ideally coming with a solution. So not coming in with a, a different name idea, um, but because that you really shouldn't, I think it'd be irresponsible to do that without having gone through a process. But saying, uh, you know, saying that I think the name stinks and you should replace it is really just kind of putting a problem in their lap. But saying, I think the name, could be better and I know a great namer that I've worked with in the past and I can you know bring that person onto the project and um, have them think about alternatives you know at least it feels like you're presenting them with some options there yeah I think I think one of the um, the things I would sort of add to that if I may is um, any suggestions for change right you as a outsider coming in um, I always think you need to be research informed like you've sort of gone through in your discovery phase. So if as a strategist, I've got a little inkling, like for me, the something doesn't ring well with the name, right? So as opportunities arise to ask consumers, for example, I'd say stuff like, so when you first entered the industry, like did you, did you, did this name stand out to you as something that you should explore? And just to, from a name, did it have any meaning to you? And I'd ask yeah. questions like that. And then really what that fun. means is later on in the process, when, um, you are sort of in a place where you've earned that trust and you've got the credibility and you're putting some ideas forward to for direction. You can then say, you know what, one of the things I discovered in the in the research, I wasn't, you know, it, it just came tumbling out and here it is. <laughs> Your name stinks. No, it doesn't. No, I wouldn't put it like that. <laughs> your, your consumers were initially confused by your name and, and you know, considering we're maybe uh, pivoting to a new place in the market, is this a good time to explore a process to, create a new name so maybe that's another way to get to get consumer insight 
um, or customer insight. It's a great point. And, and you just made me think of Jacob to, to your original question. You know, I, I'd said earlier that there probably are right and wrong reasons to change your name. One of the right reasons is if you really are shifting the, the brand position. So coming, coming full circle now and talking about positioning again, if there's a really significant change in the underlying ideas behind the brand or um, the way that the brand is positioned, um, then that is, uh, it's not a reason in and of itself to change the name, but it's an inflection point at which you, if you're going to change the name, you should do it so that it syncs up with all those other changes so that the consumer or customer has a, a rationale, a built-in rationale of, oh, they've completely switched up their positioning or the product mix or, or even just the brand personality. It's a new, a new uh, design or look and feel for the brand. And they've changed their name at the same time it's a more powerful story. It's a, a simpler way to tell the story. So that's another thing you could say to your client um, is just that, Hey, while we're making all these other changes, um, we sh you know, let's explore uh, or even just asking them, you know, have you, if you've ever thought about um, making a change to the name, this would be a good time to do it. Uh, and so at least that opens, it sort of broaches the subject without you necessarily having to, to go in and just say, in my opinion, it, yeah. it's a terrible name. Yeah, I think you said it well. It's it's about coming in the right angle with not giving your opinions and asking questions like you were saying, Matt, as well. Just asking questions and digging deeper so to actually hear their point of view before coming in with an opinion. I also wanted yeah. to loop back to positioning statements because we kind of rolled over, over that. Um, we haven't sure. really talked about positioning statements, even though it's a, a huge part of the exercise. So um, do you want to give our listeners an idea of what, what and an insight to what a positioning statement is and how you actually go about creating that statement, which is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, yeah it's another thing. Uh, so we talked about a few definitions at the beginning, and, and this is another one where there's a little more diversity of perspective on, on not necessarily what a positioning statement is, but what makes a quote unquote good positioning statement. If you look around online and, and you look at sort of best practices from business schools or, or uh, branding books, then a lot of times you'll see this kind of formulaic approach to positioning statements, which it's something like for blank, our blank is the only blank that blank, right? So for, uh, for kids, our dentistry office is the only one that, uh, you know, makes, makes going to the dentist fun. Uh, you know, however you want to kind of put that together. I think that that, um, I, I always argue that that's useful as a tool. That's a useful way to think about how you're gonna write your positioning statement. Um, in practice, for a number of reasons, I find those a little um, deflating as actual positioning statements for, especially for a client, if you're in a consultant role, because it feels so formulaic and it feels sort of anticlimactic um, and it often lacks any sort of artfulness in the writing. Um, and so in reality, and, and, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear Matt, if you have experience along these lines or, or Jacob, um, because my, a lot of my experience on this comes from working at, at bigger agencies like Interbrand. Um, so it's maybe partly because of how much, frankly, clients are paying that, that to then deliver something that feels sort of off the shelf, uh, just doesn't, um, doesn't feel right given the price tag. And so a lot of times the actual positioning statement or sometimes we might dub it a brand narrative or something like that, which you could debate what, whether that's a different thing or, or an interchangeable term. It's often longer than that. It's often written with a little more emotion in it. So you might even have an introductory couple of sentences that kind of set the stage or the context. So, um, you know, try not to make it too cheesy, but almost that sort of uh, that classic, um, movie trailer like in a world type of <laughs> type of intro right so in this industry or or in this world where this is happening and this problem you know that consumers face every day we've brought this solution to market and it's the only one that does this and then also maybe putting in some of those um tangible reasons to believe or, or proof points if you want to call them that you know so that it's not just our dentistry office is the only one that makes going to the dentist fun, but 
we have TVs on the ceiling. We have, you know, we give different kinds of toys at the end of the experience. Our waiting room, you know, was designed by uh, an expert in, you know, waiting room design for kids. I, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, but putting all of that into the statement and maybe you end up with something that's actually two or three paragraphs long, um, which, you know, might be too long for some clients. This is another thing where as a consultant, I think you need to partly just get a feel for um, what your client means when they say positioning statement, what their expectations are, um, so that you hopefully can over deliver, but not, um, not give them something that feels like it's, it's missed the mark in terms of what they're looking for. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Great. In terms of my experience, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think different clients are looking for different things. Um, and often I um, attack it, um, the listeners will know, I've, I've written a book called Story Atogy, right? Which is like uses a lot of story theory yeah. in positioning, mm -hmm. right? And so I sometimes have like a long form sh and a shorter and then a really yeah. short form. Yes, um, yes. Narrative. Uh, is how I'd attack it where you know you start in the, the status quo and then you look at what could be and the crisis that that could you know overcome and then you end with you know happily ever after the world is now better kind of system beginning middle yes. end um, yes yeah absolutely so there's loads of ways you can sort of you can do that but I also use like you were saying like formulaic ways initially in workshops to kind of right you help people almost particularly so for example if you've got a leadership team and there's i don't know 10 people in the room and you know you've got to get them aligned somehow so those those kind of brand positioning statements that uh, you know there's a number of them around they're quite helpful to say to everybody like come to the workshop with your one you know that you're comfortable with and then let's share them and then let's put them up on the wall and then let's let's pin a vote on which one sort of stands out to us emotionally um, and you can't vote for your own, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so that, yes. that um, brings an interesting, and, and clients love that kind of stuff, you know, because you're listening, they've all got a chance to have a say, but you're also then challenging and helping them align uh, around, you know, the future that they, uh, and, and the position that they want to start to think about. So that's another probably tactic, but, um, you know, then you've got to infuse that with market research and you've got to kind of make sure, but it's a good sort of kicker, you know, starter, I yes. find, to kind of figure out where is the room, where's the temperature. What about you, Jason? Have you got any experience in that? Yeah, so I, I, like you were saying, there's a lot of ways about it. And like you, I also like going through that exercise with the client because it's, it kind of gives an idea of what we're working towards and they can see in the future of what, what these exercises are actually building up to. So um, the Marty Neumeyer's one, the only in a statement, I think is a, a very yeah. strong one because it's extremely difficult to get down to that statement but um, it's very powerful once you do. So I, I'm totally on board with both of you there. Yeah, I, another I one. Just, oh, sorry, go on, go on, Rob. Yeah, no, just one comment to sort of echo something you said, Matt. Um, typically, I would deliver along with that longer form narrative something much shorter as well. So you said you have kind of the short, medium, long. Um, and it seems like there's a, a, a bit of consensus in the branding community now to, to call that a brand essence. Um, yeah. But typically, you do have a two to five word um, version. Sometimes I, I sort of tag that at the end of the longer narrative so that it almost feels like a, a tagline at the end of, a, of an ad or something like that. Um, but I think it's also partly, frankly, it's a partly about salesmanship, right? Again, as a consultant, that long form narrative is often what gets the heads nodding in the boardroom of like, yes, this, this has captured what we wanna say about our brand. Um, sometimes the brand essence does that, but often the brand essence, because it's so short, only works once you've seen that longer narrative. And then it's clear what those three words are trying to sum up, because it is really hard for, you know, any three word phrase to say as much as you want to say. So if you've sort of explained it first and then you share it, then you can kind of get alignment that, yeah, that, that captures it. And if you've really done it well, I'm sure you've had this experience too. Sometimes, even though this is all supposed to be internal strategy work, um, clients almost can't have um, putting it into ad copy or putting some of it onto their website or even considering, you know, trying to trademark that brand essence and say, say it's their tagline. Um, you know, my advice is always think of it as internal strategy work, but um, 
you know, I take it as a compliment if they like it enough to at least consider using it externally as well. That's fantastic. Well, um, I kind of wanted to sort of segue um, just for the final part, just in the next few minutes. Um, sure. You, we've talked about uh, into execution just a little bit because we talked about discovery. We've talked about capturing the idea as a second phase and, and um, we've talked about the positioning statement. Where else do you take this? And, and from a designer's perspective, like a, you know, a creative graphic design execution sort of position, which a lot of our listeners, I know, uh, you know, that's the space they're coming from. What, how do you sort of take some of that stuff? You've mentioned the red pen thing, but like sure. how then do you, do you see it sort of coming out in the graphic design, in the look and feel and the imagery? What kind of thoughts and experience and tips would you give to designers and how do you see that working? Yeah, sure. Um, I also want to apologize to you guys and your listeners if you can hear this dog back here snoring. I don't know if that's picking up on the mic, but very loud in here. I just, um, thought it was, uh, I just thought it was, you know, you, to be honest. But, um. <laughs> yeah, that's what I didn't want. That's why I said it. Um, no, back to your question. Uh, well, I'm not, I should say I'm not a designer. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I love that a lot of designers like Jacob are, are getting more involved in the strategy world. And so increasingly we have these sort of hybrid people out there that are, are great at both strategy and design. But um, as much as I like to think I, I, I can look at design work and, and um, comment intelligently about it, I, I can't create <laughs> that, that kind of work. Um, and so it's a little, uh, you know, I don't want to misrepresent myself in answering your question, but um, having worked with a lot of great designers, I, I'd say a couple of things. Um, the, the simplest way to think of it is that that strategy work would then form some kind of brief that would then inform design work. The problem with thinking of it that way is that it sounds very much like uh, a handoff, that there's no need for strategists and designers to ever talk to each other except through the brief. You know, you could hand it through uh, a hole in the wall and the designer grabs it and, and never has to talk to the strategist at all. Um, while in reality, at, at every agency I've talked about um, or I've worked at, um, we've always made an effort to ensure that uh, both designers are involved from the get-go, um, that they can sit in on some interviews in that discovery phase, that uh, and, and even if we don't know that, you know, there's going to be a logo redesign or something like that, but just because designers think differently and they're part of the process and we want that thought process and, and style of thinking involved, um, you know, having them look at the questions that we're planning on asking and, and comment on those, having them sit in on probably not every single interview, just from a resource and time standpoint, that might not be possible, but a couple of key interviews um, can be really helpful. And, and so that they sort of slowly ramp up. Also, I know I keep going back to this idea of kind of just being a, an agency, and I don't know how many of your listeners are, are, are agency people, but it's good to get your designers or all of your people in front of your clients earlier so that they start to familiarize themselves with them and it doesn't feel like they've been handed off to some entirely new team once they've uh, you know, gotten to know the strategy team. Um, and then also for the strategist to stay involved until the end. So even when um, you know, the designer is going to present logo options, certainly, but, but even further along than that, once they're getting into sort of the minutia of just fine tuning the brand guidelines, it's great to have a st strategist along for that ride to ensure continuity. Um, and because strategists think differently um, and sometimes are better with words and so might be able to do a better job of helping the designer explain why they're recommending a certain uh, look and feel or, or, or something like that. Um, so having much more of a, a parallel path uh, of those two uh, team members or, or ways of thinking is, uh, is the best way to go if you can afford to do that. I love that. I love that. I think that's brilliant. So what you were, you were kind of, uh, I think, alluding to is this kind of um, getting them a lot more involved, get, get, getting designers involved in these conversations early um, actively. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's not kind of this cold, Here's a brief. Here's a here's a here's a sheet of yeah. paper. Now make us some pretty pictures. You know, it's it's an integral part. The design thinking, as it, the creative thinking, in the whole process, which I think is important to to sort yeah. of say. 
Absolutely. Mm. And I think, um, I, I think, you know, newer and younger uh, agency people or freelancers, I think, I think and hope that they sort of intuitively understand this, that the more that like design thinking is talked about, the more that there are designers trying to understand brand strategy and, and maybe vice versa. Hopefully it's becoming a little more intuitive and, and so it doesn't even need to be said anymore. But um, but yeah, the idea of having there be sort of a handoff point in the middle um, is pretty old school at best and, and at worst, you know, never, never worked all that well. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, having everybody along for the ride uh, throughout the project is, is the way to go. Brilliant. Right, well, um, I think we're coming to the end of our time now. Um, just before I wrap up, Jacob, did you have anything you wanted to kind of add or, or any kind of final tiny little questions to sort of ping Rob while we've got him? That was, that was a final question for me. So I, I think we've touched on a lot of positioning and naming. So I really appreciate your time, Rob. It's been brilliant speaking with you. Um, we can ask where we can find you. Or you can just give a, a little plug and sure. we'll give you the mic. All right. Well, it's been my pleasure joining you guys. Um, and Matt, thanks for plugging uh, my podcast as well at the top there. <laughs> so I'll just mention it again. It's, uh, it's How Brands Are Built. Um, it's been around for about three years and three seasons. Um, the first season was all about naming. Um, second, third, more about positioning and, and other sort of brand strategy topics, brand experience and things like that. I also do run my agency, Heirloom, which you can find at heirloomagency.com. Um, the podcast is at howbrandsarebuilt.com. And other than that, look around on social media and uh, you'll, find, uh, you'll find handles for, for me and for those uh, entities as well. Fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure, Rob, having you on. Thanks so much for your insights. I've absolutely loved all of it from, from going through your, you know, your process to the three C's. It genuinely has been a, an absolute pleasure. Um, and so thank you for your time and good luck in the future. And hopefully we, we might have you back at some stage. Um, what I'd just say to our listeners is thank you for tuning in today and um, be sure to, uh, to kind of uh, comment, like, follow, share uh, the podcast. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.